And my next question today, within the context of Belarus, just before the independence declaration, I want to ask Andre, uh, you were studying the perestroika period, uh, also uh, of those people who were for the um, Soviet state regime and so on. So, can we say that in this con context, Belarus was the most pro Soviet among these republics? And Alessia Domovich said, we remember, and that Belarus leadership was the most conservative part of the leaders of all Soviet republics in this region. and. Were these leaders ready for the independence in 1991? Yeah, thank you. In the last years, really, I've been researching a lot um, in terms of materials of late 80s and beginning of 90s, in terms of research of pro-Soviet organizations and also political history of all Western Soviet republics generally. <laughs> so, uh, uh, two things were very interesting lately that is the pandemic and the political crisis. And uh, I believe that I will soon publish a book about that. And surely. Uh, there were these republics who were very different. Uh, well, they were like, you know, friendly, Soviet social republic and so on. However, the societies were very different. The political situation was very different. But perhaps I will start from the metaphor about the Belarus that is used by our ideologists to make it positive. Belarus, of course, was not the one day, as we call it. In terms that one day was actually fighting against uh, the revolution. When they were just uh, fighting for the monarchy in France and so on, but you know, Belarus was not fighting for anything. It was just sitting quietly and they couldn't understand what that was about. So there was no active position of the leadership of the country. Uh, and that Belarus was not ready for that? Yes, I believe so. Why? There were many factors. There were many factors. Of course, uh, I believe it is proven that if we say, take the elections of 1990 to the Supreme Soviet, uh, the elections were in all of the Soviet Union, and they fixed the political situation in each of the region, in each of the Soviet Republic, in the Baltic states, so of course. Uh, the majority was taken by the National Fronts and the supporting organizations. Uh, uh, for example, the Communist Party of Lithuania was already for the independence. Uh, the Communist parties in uh, Latin Estonia were split uh, in half in terms of the nationalities. In, and in the Ukraine, for instance, uh, the majority was pro-Soviet, uh, more than 52%. Uh, 
uh, was for the Soviet cause, and 25% were for the independence of uh, Ukraine. So 52 versus 25 percent in Belarus. The Belarus National Front uh, got about only 8 percent, 60-70 percent in the Baltic states, 25 percent in Ukraine, and only 8 percent in Belarus. Well, it's difficult to put the borderline between them because some didn't identify very clearly themselves. But roughly two-thirds were against the dependence. So that's, us uh, you know, very contrary to what was in the Baltic states. And similar to was in Ukraine and Moldova. That's why Belarus, of course, was very late with that. So the reasons were many. Uh, I will not describe all of them. I'd like to mention two of them. Of course, uh, it was uh, the factor of Russification and the weak point in a, of identity of the Russians and uh, the issues of history. The Belarusian Soviet history was interpreted very wrongly and actually falsified, and, but that was not the main problem. The problem was uh, that uh, the people of Belarus didn't know anything about the former history, about the great duchy of Lithuania, and so on. If you look at the academic history publications, we can see that the comments of the Communist Party Congress uh, received much more attention in terms of pages than uh, the Congress of the Russian Communist Party. In terms of ignoring the Belarusian history. Uh, and the second thing is important, which is really mentioned. It's a deep crisis of Belarusian nomenclature in the late 90s. Uh, after the Second World War, there were three personalities, Mazov, Mosherov, and Kiselov. They were the leaders. And uh, in the beginning of the 80s, they were out of the political scene. After 1983, that was an important year. After that, it's just chaos within uh, the new elite of uh, the Russian nomenclature. It was very weak elite. Kebich, Mesnikovich, and other personalities of leadership, uh, they didn't have the understanding what the Republic was about, what the interests were about. They could speak about agriculture, about certain branches of industry, but they did not imagine themselves as the leaders of the Republic. But it's also important that uh, the British Belarus came to the independence with a big crisis of the Belarusian elite leadership. And the nomenclature actually was victorious in the elections of 1990, but they were not able to create any political force, any political party. There were fractions in the Supreme Soviet, uh, they had about two weeks after the election, or sometimes in two years, to have a, a, a different party. 
which shows that the political elite was not ready for it, and the Belarusian nomenclature was uh, also crushed by the non-system person, that is Lukashenko, in 1994. And the people who were, had all the resources actually lost to a person who was completely out of the circle. And after this huge defeat, they were immediately out. And that was a unique situation among the former Soviet republics. So, of course, Belarus was not ready for independence in the political sense of the word. And there were a lot of problems related to the crisis, inside crisis of the leadership of the communist nomenclature, the weak national identity, and also uh, non-readiness of understanding of uh, the Republic of Belarus as a political subject. And in that, Belarus lagged behind a lot compared to other Soviet republics. Thank you. Uh, One more question to Alexander. Alexander Dobrovolsky. So at the time, you were between Minsk and Moscow. You were an active member of the Supreme Soviet in Moscow. So your view from the outside, how Belarus was actually active in Moscow, how the Belarusian question was tackled in Moscow, and uh, how important Belarus was in terms of the uh, disintegration of the Soviet Union. And another question, can we say that independence of Belarus was uh, achieved as a result of the disintegration of the Soviet Union as an external factor as opposed to the national movement from the inside? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Thank you that you invited me. And uh, my best wish is to Rainer, who has been doing it uh, for so many years. And now I try to answer questions. I believe that these are difficult questions on one hand, because the Belarus agenda in Moscow in the Congress of the Supreme Soviet or other cabinets where everything was decided was really very weak. Kebich, as uh, the future prime minister, was uh, for more independence and more changes. And for me, he looked as a quite progressive person. I was not a, a, you know, a good politician or experienced politician at the time. I was just 30. I was just an engineer at the time. And uh, I was just having my lessons at that decision-making level. And uh, then I was comparing um, about how these questions were tackled in other form, former Soviet republics. And of course, we then heard from uh, the Baltic republics in terms of a national interest, uh, national interest first, but from Belarusians, it was not the question. The question was not raised even in these terms. And uh, even us, we were asking the questions in terms of democratic topics, not uh, the national issues. Even the Georgians, the Moldovians were talking more about uh, 
the national issues. The Moldovan deputy to Yurga was uh, giving a speech, and and at one point he said, "Your time is out." And she said, "Look, I am talking about the interests of my country. How can you say my time is up?" And of course, the Belarusian political elite was not ready for independence. And also, I can say that when we talk about uh, the elite generally, yes, they were not ready. But when we look at the ideas uh, popular in Belarus, so we can say that these ideas had been popular quite long ago. And in 1991, the, the Belarusian National Front was created. Uh, they were already voiced, and that was important as the democratic approach. Uh, did not have the idea of independence. And at that point, these ideas were integrated, integrated uh, when the National Front started to be active in 1989. And that included, firstly, the intelligentsia, like the writers, the artists, and Vasil Bikov and Sedamovich and Marchkin, they became the political activists and then prepared the political view of Belarusian independence. So the, the Belarus was not ready, yes, but not 100%. Mm, you say Sokolov and Demente actually were people of quite low intellect level, and they didn't have much responsibility for the future of their country. And in the Soviet Union, the Communist Party was led by the first secretary in the Republic, and the second secretary was always a Russian who was sent from Kremlin. And the second secretary in Belarus was more progressive than our elite politicians. So I believe that if we had people like Algidas Brazauskas in Lithuania, then the situation was very different. And Brazauskas, uh, he came as a leader of the Lithuanian movement not as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Lithuania, but as a Lithuanian, the leader of the country. And our leaders didn't have this understanding. And each politician uh, uh, Now I will stick to your question whether Belarus became independent as a result of uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, I would say yes. Was it accidental? I would say no. Uh, it's understandable that also that the Russian Empire, the Russian Empire uh, was in big crisis at the beginning of the 20th century. And the disintegration of the Russian Empire also started after the revolution of 1917. First uh, the February Revolution and then the October Revolution. And then there was reincarnation of the Empire in 1922 in terms of the Soviet Union. And the Gor Gedar in his book, uh, The Disintegration of the Empire, he says the, the final disintegration of the empire came in 1991. I believe he's wrong. And I talked with him, and he said, Well, let's see what will be in the future. But basically, uh, the disintegration started in 81 and still continuing. But Belarus, yes, they actually had to become independents 
despite of its will, as there were people in Belarus who were hoping for this independence and who were forming the vision of new Belarus. And the fact that today we have the Soviet identity, the post-Soviet identity, and on the other hand we have the consensus for the independence. And uh, this is thanks to what uh, our other people historically were thinking about the independence of Belarus and they thought that the Belarusians uh, had to have their independence anyway. Yes, and I can say that the disintegration of the Soviet Union was made uh, along the borders of uh, the Soviet republics. And Belarus was also independent within the borders of the Soviet Socialist Republic. And the creation of independent state also implied also implied the opportunity to change the foreign policy and geopolitical orientation not only for Belarus, but for other people also. We can see that Lithuania took this opportunity and became the member of the EU and NATO. Had Belarus this opportunity to become a European country, and how can we assess the achievements of external policy of Belarus? So I will start answer this question about the people also who were, who were like that. During the last 10 years, there have been big changes within the society of Belarus. Of course, there are several reasons, like the level of education has grown compared to the, the beginning of the 90s, and also the growth of private sector. This is the growth of private sector as the middle class. Uh, of so we know uh, that uh, we are talking that there are more towns, more cities, and people want a high level of uh, living. And some changes, of course, that took place. And we're talking about evolution, not revolution. You just like the word better. And when we talk about our achievements, Perhaps it's a good day today to discuss it, because yesterday, as we know, the Russian media wrote that Lukashenko actually invited himself to visit the Crimea. And in fact, there was a comment that he recognized that the Crimea was a part of Russia. Well, it was, of course, a certain uh, move going closer to the Kremlin. And, of course, if we talk of, of the regime in Minsk, we can say this is lost of reputation of independence country. And another event that happened yesterday, that's the roadmap. Uh, you remember that uh, the Kremlin told Lukashenko, just sign it first and then we'll do economic integration. And Lukashenko eventually Mm. I was trying to avoid this question from 
of 2014, and we can see that these old maps uh, became very important. He signed the papers. Uh, I cannot say that we immediately became dependent politically on uh, Russia, but we are on this road in terms that if there are any changes, Hmm. The dollar should not go too far away from Russia if Lukashenko one day is out or anything happens to him. So when we talk about our achievements, unfortunately the Russian vector here is very negative. And this is not accidental. Of course we can see that these actions are directed of a certain loss of the position and sovereignty and independence. So now the Western vector. Well, the example of integration, of course, is the Western Partnership Program, and Belarus has participated much less than other countries like Azerbaijan, Moldova, Ukraine, Armenia, and other countries. Uh, however, certain projects were realized in Belarus as well. So we have received certain technical support, uh, especially the projects in infrastructure. So in that respect, everything depended uh, on the mood in Minsk because our relationship with the West and Europe, you know, and, and Pompeo was visiting, visiting us and Sikorsky and other top people. So in fact, there was no breakthrough in that respect. And Lukashenko today is saying that, look, Belarus is rejecting the Western partnership, but it has not been participating actively in it. So here, unfortunately, the situation is worsening in terms of achievements, and there is nothing to boast about in this respect. And again, coming back to the people, the people has become a political subject, and I believe that despite Lukashenko leading us to an a different direction. The people actually see the reason in integration into the democratic world, and this is very important, and not what uh, the top uh, leader in Belarus, Belarus is doing. I just want to add uh, that Lukashenko is not like uh, an evil genius. You know, he was also oriented towards the situation and certain political independence uh, at the time, right? So, next question. I'm giving this question to everyone. Let's go back to 1994. During the first presidential election, uh, Lukashenko was elected, and everybody knows uh, that. Uh, but uh, I would like to pay your attention uh, to the fact uh, that uh, uh, similar processes in 1993, 94, 95, uh, where the similar processes were in other uh, countries, uh, ex-communist, uh, non-democrats, uh, non-freedom uh, fighters, but those who in the beginning of the 90s uh, uh, were accumulating the capital, the, the assets, uh, also in Lithuania, Brazauskas came to the power, in Ukraine, Kuchma, in Poland, uh, Kwasniewski, and uh, so on. So these were the people who were the elite before. And um, so this post-Renaissance happened everywhere. And these uh, people, uh, they were speaking about uh, the market economy, European integration. And here we see uh, that it is very different from Belarus. Why? Uh, in the context of uh, uh, this coming back, uh, Belarus uh, still 
couldn't uh, keep up uh, on this wave and uh, didn't follow the other countries of Central Eastern Europe. <clears throat> I will try to explain it. Uh, going back to the crisis in Belarus, which happened in the second part of the 80s. And uh, not, it's not the nomenclature that was good or bad. The problem is that Perestroika uh, matched uh, in time with this crisis and this great, uh, uh, I'm now speaking of course uh, about uh, state leaders that uh, were defining the politics uh, for decades and uh, this chaos and crisis uh, together with Perestroika, together with the 90s as in the Declaration of Sovereignty, uh, the uh, Independence, all of this just matched together. The big difference between Belarus and other republics, you said it right, that uh, who comes back to power? Nomenclature. And uh, it's not that non-systemic person comes to power in Belarus. Systemic person, um, this is a vice versa process, right? So those who had political uh, experience, some assets uh, as a result of this transformation, they get the support. And this is what happened also in Lithuania. It happened in Ukraine at that time, in Moldova, it's a little bit uh, different uh, story, and uh, we can speak about Voronin uh, uh, and his elections a bit uh, later, and, very pop and was very popular politician for quite a long time. Speaking about Estonia and Latvia, uh, all the elite was uh, related to communist uh, nomenclature, and uh, then again, in national movements, they did exist, uh, uh, but they did not relate themselves to the Communist uh, Party, for example, the independent uh, movement in Estonia. But this was periphery. This was just uh, still, it wasn't that prominent. They were not related to a uh, Communist Party. And uh, this, what Alexander has uh, mentioned uh, is that when we are talking about uh, mm, that there were a lot of people in Belarus, a lot of citizens who wanted independence in the uh, 80s, beginning of 90s, that's right. But, in all the cases, success uh, was uh, still dependent on how the communist nomenclature was supported. Estonia, for example, 1988, Estonian National Front, uh, in all the communist uh, articles, uh, they were advertising that this organization is being established. Uh, a lot uh, of, uh, many of the nomenclature uh, have supported it, especially on the first stage, 98, um, 88, 89, uh, then uh, the state uh, television, uh, Estonian uh, uh, shows, TV shows, radio shows, uh, all of them uh, broadcasted the advertisement. Uh, the same happened in uh, Latvia. In Lithuania there was a uh, uh, a different uh, situation uh, because national uh, movement was separated from the communist nomenclature but still the tendencies uh, were quite the same. The, of course we had articles about Sayudis and uh, so on. So the distance was less in Ukraine. There were some regions where all the communist uh, nomenclature supported uh, National Front, uh, uh, especially in the West. Uh, same about Moldova and Belarus. No, Belarus is different. Uh, so there was um, I think that uh, this uh, second secretary example is uh, shows a lot because in his memoirs uh, he is writing, uh, for example, uh, 1989, uh, 1991, uh, approximately this time that uh, he is uh, proposing to the first secretary uh, to the nomenclature to have a dialogue with a Belarus National uh, Front uh, because uh, we need to talk, we need to discuss and we have perestroika and uh, uh, it, it all should be transparent but all the nomenclature is saying no, we will never sit at one uh, discussion table with them. 
So yeah, there might be some channels uh, for connection, but we're not going to collaborate with them. We're not going to have any joint actions with them. And uh, how Belarus again was different. Belarusian National Front. This is the only national front of that period that was acting. Uh, um, for example, in 1981, uh, uh, that was act acting not in Belarus, but uh, there meeting was held for example in Vilnius in 1989 although others uh, were all the time making any organizing all the meetings um, inside but of course this was sanctioned by the local communist uh, party so that's why they had to move to Vilnius all the other national fronts uh, either it was very simple for example like in Baltic states and in Moldova to get uh, uh, to uh, hold the meeting inside the country or they could uh, hold uh, it uh, like in Ukraine for example but in Belarus the distance between the opposition and nomenclature was uh, much wider than anywhere else and it was a deep political crisis and this led to 1994 events and I I think that phenomenon of uh, Lukashenko, non-systemic person who uh, who is victorious over nomenclature and gets the power. And in other countries everything happened a completely different way because nomenclature was coming back to the power, it had potential, it had assets uh, and it was supported. Belarus and nomenclature lost. And uh, it came uh, uh, off the scene after 1999 for sure, but uh, it, this process started since 1994, that it has started losing power. Yeah, these were just leftovers. I think Andrei has offered us a very interesting uh, uh, analysis. And with Alexei Lostovsky, we were taking uh, part in uh, one event. Uh, and I think this uh, question of uh, self-identity uh, and asking who we are and uh, Again, history itself, yeah, it, it is very important in order for us to understand how and why it happened. During that event, I presented uh, uh, a speech uh, speaking about the past and the future. And the thesis was that uh, the understanding of who we are and where we are going and uh, it is not just... Uh, some structures, but this is the mass understanding, mass consciousness, uh, is the cause of our way. In short, I'll tell you the, what discourses we have found in our consciousness. Um, first, this is a Russian imperial discourse, so this means that we need to be linked with Russia. Another discourse is Soviet and post-Soviet. We are Soviet people who are who have inherited have inherited the Soviet Union that has disintegrated and it wasn't successful disintegration. And again, this is the main um, mode now in Belarus. It is uh, being uh, um, supported. Uh, by our non-legitimate uh, authority. Again here we have, so where are we from? Are we from the Russian uh, Empire? Are we from the, th are we Belarusians? Yeah, this is the third discourse. And we have uh, Polotsk, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch's uh, roots. Uh, then uh, we know about the Institute of Belarusian uh, uh, Culture and then we have to speak about the Great Duchy of uh, uh, Lithuania. And next, we also can say that uh, we as a nation have been living in different uh, uh, discourses and we shouldn't be thinking uh, about how we are different from others. But uh, we just need to, um, have to understand uh, how we are going to move forward. 
because Andre is saying that nomenclature lost, but it hasn't, because uh, this post-Soviet approach, uh, always the second, not the first, our leaders were feeling themselves this way, they were always looking up at Moscow, and uh, this again we're speaking about a person who have reanimated, yes, this uh, um, m m Moscow approach. So again, speaking here about the independence, inevitably um, it's quite a harsh uh, rivalship with post-Soviet discourse, which is still dominant, I believe, in uh, Belarusian information, intellectual uh, environment, and in the mass consciousness. So, new generation has grown up, they are ready for independence, and they got used to independence, and uh, that's why this clash happened. New independence approach, and it's very interesting where we have been living before. But also it's interesting to know how are we going to live. So it's, it's a, you know, this past and future. Вот и Андрей Александрович основательно все этот вопрос затронули. Про, хочу продолжить тему, которую Александр начал. Еще... The topic that uh, Alexandra has started, the phenomenon of identity, mm, when I was uh, researching uh, in the field of uh, history of uh, Belarus, uh, the uh, end of the uh, 90s, uh, beginning of this uh, century, so the, we're interested in the geography of uh, the human being. And now, when Alexander, for example, is uh, uh, telling us about uh, the biography. Uh, the, in the, our poll we had a very um, a simple question of the nationality. And we were working on the periphery, in the villages, uh, with people uh, who and, and, and these people, when we, they were seeing uh, this question, they were shocked. Question they, they were saying, we are Russians, we, we, are, we attend the church, this kind of answers. Or before, we used to be Polish, and now most probably we're Belarusian. Uh, so, the understanding was that we are local people, we're just living here, and you're asking us strange questions. What is your nationality? In Minsk, uh, the one of the women said, "I am Belarusian," and that was uh, very, uh, very. This was so surprising, but uh, it turned out uh, that uh, her daughter is uh, studying um, law at university. So that explains much. Again, historians cannot tackle these problems. For example, textbooks. Uh, non-Soviet textbooks and also Soviet textbooks in uh, Belarus. I was analyzing oh, these are school and university textbooks. Belarus was never a subject of history. Russia, Poland, uh, uh, Lithuanians, they were uh, subjects, uh, even uh, German uh, occupants. But uh, Belarusians, no. They were not deciding their future, and they were not even deciding anything. And this is a very difficult, this is a horrible situation. It's uh, difficult to write a story uh, and uh, to analyze history if we, you understand this uh, subjectification. And uh, we understand that we are such a good country, all around us are enemies. Uh, he's the enemy, she's the enemy, and I have nothing to do with it. Mm, but when you start analyzing the history, we start understanding that uh, there was some kind of occupation somebody shared with uh, occupants the authority, the power on certain territories. Somebody, somebody uh, uh, 
could even be suspected in treason how can we speak about it we're so tolerant we're so good we are uh, trying so hard to be good and everybody around us we're bad this is also an interesting uh, moment uh, which is not maybe very openly felt but uh, I remember in the 1990s and uh, later the dominant approach was what can we do what can be done? We don't have anything. We don't have any resources. We cannot change anything. We only have to join with somebody and in joint action do it. And uh, in uh, 1994, of course, this was revenge. Of course, Andrei is um, right. This was non-systemic nomenclature. Lukashenko is different. And there was no uh, vision uh, to the future. There was... Uh, um, turning back to the past. Uh, there was no plan of what's going to happen uh, next. Historians uh, were all the time joking that uh, maybe the Soviet Union can be uh, revived and this uh, false uh, Dim Dimitri, um, you know, the third false Dimitri who is trying to savor the empire, for example, could emerge again. This is what historians were saying. I'm not a historian, so I do not have that many fantastic stories, but I want to add uh, uh, my insights to what Alexander has mentioned on who we are and on those five items that were enumerated by Alexander. Also, um, I think... Um, this separation of the last year was very uh, valuable and who are Belarusians uh, for most of the people it's uh, values it means values that we have I don't want to go back to history because I'm not that good in history as my colleagues uh, who have gathered here but let's speak about future about values uh, because values are very important for our future we will need to somehow in, in, not, non, not taking into account this polarization, but still we need to live with, with these people uh, in future and we need to find a common ground uh, to somehow uh, reach uh, the compromise. Because this is quite a huge problem and uh, the analysis of what has happened before maybe will help us to compromise with uh, people whose values are different, but they are also Belarusians. I think oh, Andrei wants to add something. I would like to react. Oh. One moment uh, only. If uh, nomenclature has won or lost, it has lost in the, on a political ground. And I'm not sure if they were moved by values and they believed so much in the Soviet Union. These were the same politicians as in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Moldova, who in 1985 uh, were pro-Lenin, pro-Soviet Union, and uh, Brazauskas in 1988 uh, on uh, uh, strikes he was uh, also talking about the big role of uh, Lenin uh, for Lithuanian nation but they all shifted because the situation has changed and they understood what is happening they understood disintegration is happening and they understood that their authority and their power depends on how they uh, initiate and organize their state but in Belarus it didn't happen Belarus uh, didn't manage to do it. The Belarus was just not ready politically to uh, for such kind of solutions. But there is another moment about identity that I would like to point out. This is Soviet identity. We are in we have inherited it and uh, this uh, vision became dominant in Belarus nowadays. But I don't think that it's very prominent now. I think uh, it's passing away. This period was prolonged, of course, when Belarus was Soviet. But uh, again, they lost. Because there was only emotion and memory of how good it was. How many monuments 
Moshed of monuments were erected in the last 30 years. This is a central figure of uh, Soviet history. They should be preying uh, on him. But how many? Maybe several monuments. How many uh, monuments to Mazurov? It's another hero. Many of you can't even remember him, but it is the person who whose uh, career in the Soviet on the Soviet grounds was the most successful. Kiselev. Who is Kiselev? Nobody remembers, nobody knows. But the, for two decades this person was the head uh, of uh, the Council of Ministers and uh, he was the first secretary. Where are the monuments erected uh, in memory of them? Uh, so there was no uh, feeling, only emotions. There was no mm, values attached, only emotional component. Yeah, so the work hasn't been done. And uh, now, uh, if we take this uh, Soviet uh, approach, what is behind it? It's empty. New politicians coming to the political ground, they don't have this emotional uh, relationship or to anything Soviet. And uh, I do not see it uh, happening again. And this uh, um, construction, if, if it's not viable even. I think uh, uh, now in uh, Belarus uh, we have citizens, we have this and that kind of situation, but it's not supported anymore, it's empty. Yes, Andrei, you have just said that these people are Soviet, and for them, Soviet is in Moscow, but not in Minsk. This is the problem. Soviet is very much related to imperial. They value Stalin, Brezhnev, uh, but not Mazurov and not Kiselev. That's all. So... Uh, but I do agree that it's passing away. Many new people are coming who don't have any emotional or rational relation to it. They don't understand why we should look into the past. And uh, Belarus uh, has been turning into the past uh, for the last few years very, in a very intense manner. For me, it's very difficult not to react. Not even one monument for Masharov uh, is erected, and uh, the boulevard of uh, Masharov um, in the center of Minsk was renamed. It was renamed uh, to the boulevard of uh, um, Victory. So, again, uh, the surname Masharov was taken out of the school textbooks even. So I think that the memory of Masharov was uh, erased on purpose so that he is not a rival for Lukashenko. And uh, Soviet now in Belarus is concentrated uh, uh, along uh, this victory in uh, uh, the war but uh, and all of this uh, uh, glory but uh, party leaders partisans uh, heroes they are forgotten and again I'm saying that they have lost in their fight for identity on one hand, they're saying that Belarus is the continuation of Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. But in their discourse, there is no uh, BSSR. Uh, there is Soviet army, and BSSR, uh, as in itself, is, is not even, it doesn't have any uh, positive content. There is not even one textbook or book that would be uh, uh, written about it. But we have the September the 17th, uh, the holiday, the celebration of national uh, unity. Yeah, but the logic is the same. This is Stalin decree. So Stalin that has been taken, uh, the decision that has been taken, uh, uh, has been made by Stalin in Minsk. So this holiday 
is related to that somebody did something good to uh, Belarus, but the Soviet army came to Western Belarus, uh, and uh, at that moment the Belarusian army there was not even such notion. So they sort of want it, but they can't do it because in history, in the history of BSSR, they could have found uh, another date that would have been related to BSSR story more, not to the external policy of uh, uh, Soviet Union. I think that uh, we have uh, spoken, <laughs> now the third panel shouldn't happen at all, it's no need because we have discussed it also. So I would like uh, to first cover our topic and the let's speak about the disintegration of the um, Soviet Union uh, and I hope that the answers will be short. Sovietologists uh, that uh, were uh, professionally, uh, as, that were analyzing it as their professional career, not any one of them could uh, foresee that in 1991 the Soviet Union would disintegrate and that the independent Republic of Belarus will emerge. If we um, remember the 20, 2020, nobody politologists, sociologists, nobody has foreseen the scale of the protests that happened and are happening in Belarus. For the question to Andrei, can humanitarian and social sciences foresee the future? But yes, we understand that uh, they can interpret what happened already, but can we foresee uh, the cardinal shifts that absolutely change the picture. Can we do it? As a historian, I foresee the past, not the future. Speaking about this situation uh, seriously, uh, I don't know what to say. Most probably you need to be a sociologist or politologist, not the historian. Uh, but uh, our situation in the 90s uh, and uh, later, uh, how can we analyze the authoritarian, totalitarian state? This is a specific specificity of that state. You think uh, in one way, you act in another way. And how to really uh, analyze it, how to research this, what should be the level of sociology and uh, how to analyze it. But uh, the Western sociology is uh, a very high uh, level and uh, good quality and the uh, mechanisms of uh, Western society. I don't know if he if it could work for Belarusian society, for the research of Belarusian society. It works in the Western world. It doesn't work here and doesn't give the uh, results. So, and it's very difficult. Also, um, independent uh, historical uh, result, uh, uh, of course, Belar Belarusians are partisans, uh, partisan nation, and uh, they are uh, sometimes hiding uh, even from themselves. Oh, and suddenly they show themselves. Partisan nation, I think, is a very uh, important uh, uh, symbol in Belarus about sociology not long ago Tatiana Vadalashka uh, I, I took an interview I have interviewed Tatiana and uh, it was very interesting uh, to listen to her and uh, now we are going through the process uh, of uh, uh, social humanitarian uh, science uh, um, uh, death Social humanitarian sciences cannot develop, cannot live. They are part of the uh, social discourse and they can only exist, but they cannot thrive. And uh, yes, you can, you know, the science cannot... The science cannot only concentrate on some geniuses who work out, live and work outside Belarus. It works in another way. And uh, I asked uh, Tatiana, 
uh, this question because she is working on the reform of the education in educational system in uh, Belarus. Uh, and uh, Tatiana said that it is impossible to uh, introduce any reforms. I'm speaking about social humanitarian uh, uh, sciences. Uh, so I cannot even add anything else. Andre gave me the mic because he didn't. He said that it's a painful question for him and he doesn't want to experience that pain and answer it. So this uh, this topic that you have uh, uh, raised is really very um, difficult. Me having a being a humanitarian myself uh, in in this field, the system is so difficult. It's difficult to analyze and difficult to foresee. But some people do undertake it, and they are called future futurologists. So you can uh, read Kurzweil, for example, uh, the famous fu 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 futurologist. Uh, so yes, they do uh, foresee the future. But futuristic uh, research uh, that I have been doing, but uh, not on the scientific level, but just on the social level, so that to understand how political processes can um, can uh, develop. Uh, yes, uh, we do this uh, political forecasting, but uh, Vadim, for example, have been also have been doing it. So there, during this research, we uh, try to understand what are the tendencies and trends that uh, um, uh, depict the situation. What are the subjects that make decisions uh, and uh, how... Uh, what are the conflicts uh, between them? What are the coalitions? Uh, how we uh, then create the matrix? And... Uh, I think that nobody can foresee the future, but uh, to foresee the variants uh, of the events, of the future events, this is possible. We have uh, foreseen uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war in uh, 2009, just in our scenarios. Uh, Kadyrov in Chechnya, uh, that we also have uh, foreseen, but this is non-scientific. Uh, you need to understand that. But some of the insights, yes, they were possible. As for uh, the Soviet Union disintegration 1991, could somebody foresee that? Yes, there were such people. Petr Schweitzer, uh, the, his book uh, Victory, you can read it, and uh, it's it's not scientific, uh, but there are a lot of facts um, presented uh, where he for sees how these actions uh, could influence uh, and he was showing who, who planned what. Richard Pipes, uh, I read Richard Pipes, uh, uh, his uh, book on reminiscence uh, and uh, not long ago I've read it and there he also is speaking, uh, he, he was working in Harvard and in Harvard nobody believed in what he was saying but he and other people were foreseeing uh, um, and forecasting uh, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. But me, for example, when I was looking at, uh, when I saw the minus uh, strikes, and uh, when I saw that they were, they were not paid salaries, I understood that crisis is on its way, and most probably something will happen. But the putsch that happened... Uh, before that, for me, it was a signal that, yes, most probably the Soviet Union is going to be disintegrated because the putsch uh, uh, wasn't uh, developed after three days. So it's a difficult topic uh, and it's difficult to speak about it. Uh, and uh, speaking about 2020, most probably... <coughs> Uh, 2017 is very important uh, where we had mass protests uh, about this tax and most probably this was a sign that people first were waiting uh, for something they were saying that uh, Lukashenko is going uh, 
to he's not going to introduce this uh, text but when Lukashenko um, did it uh, and uh, they understood that uh, there is nothing good that they can expect from Lukashenko from the beginning I was speaking about shift uh, in values uh, uh, quality of life uh, generations uh, which happened in Belarus and based on the research of this trends of the last five to ten five to ten years we can or could speak about protests activity uh, especially having in mind the events in 2017 of course I am not saying that I I knew something and foreseen it but uh, going back to the old texts this mobilization it was there I think uh, I know exactly the answer to the question and for me it's not painful at all because if uh, social political sciences can, can, um, are able to foresee and forecast the events it's a very bad situation the society will not will stop developing if Western uh, sociologists uh, have forecasted a uh, Soviet Union disintegration in 1981 uh, 89 or in 1991 um, it wouldn't have disintegrated because the disintegration was based on the fact that nobody believed that it will disintegrate so for me only one uh, uh, for example I will give you one example uh, from the discussions on the future of uh, Soviet Union and uh, so on the Moscow political elite Yeltsin for example and other players they were ready uh, to uh, they were ready for the independence of other republics and they were sure that uh, they uh, the, the republics uh, still are going to be dependent on us or on resources uh, economy uh, oil gas uh, and so on so this rhetoric in 1991 was obvious if Western politologists, uh, sociologists in uh, 1989, for example, have foreseen it, then uh, elite, uh, Soviet elite would have acted in a different way and there would be no disintegration. The same is with 2020. If uh, Belarusian experts uh, have foreseen the, would have foreseen the uh, uh, protest of uh, or, or the um, um, events of 2020 in Belarus, they, they wouldn't have happened or they would have happened in a different uh, uh, format. Uh, of course, uh, they can forecast uh, some uh, of some part of the processes or some events, but there is always uh, something uh, uh, that is uh, just not um, uh, possible. And uh, some of the events uh, happen uh, uh, to the worse uh, to the better I don't see any problem in it uh, social sciences uh, they make uh, society more stable balanced uh, and uh, they uh, prevent conflicts uh, smooth in uh, some of uh, those rough uh, areas uh, and this means uh, development and sustainability of course they cannot solve all the problems and we do not need all the problems to be solved but uh, uh, for example uh, social polls. Of course social polls uh, let us uh, solve many uh, social uh, problems and uh, uh, the beginning of 20th century there was a discourse uh, on uh, there was no mechanism of understanding what people want and uh, usually it was always like a spontaneous change, spontaneous alteration, non-regulated process. Now we understand we can regulate these uh, processes uh, by sociology, sociological polls, um, so that we understand what tendencies uh, are there, but that doesn't mean that we can fully uh, steer it. Um, thank you. In the beginning of the 21st century, 
physicist uh, had a theory or a hypothesis uh, that if we had known where all the particles are and to what uh, speed they move at, we could foresee the future. Then the quantum mechanics uh, uh, emerged uh, and everybody understood that uh, to foresee the future or to predict the future in the material world and uh, not in the human society is just Mm, impossible and it is impossible also in the society among humans but uh, I want to add something to what Andrei has mentioned of course George Soros in his book The Alchemy of Finances uh, is uh, saying that uh, reality uh, is developing comp in a complex manner if uh, uh, the dollar uh, um, if, if, for example, the do the currency, some currency, let's say dollar, has to change tomorrow, uh, it will change. But if uh, we know about it today that it's going to change, then it's not going to happen. So again, we develop in the way how we understand ourselves, how we identify ourselves, and uh, this... Uh, uh, forms our reality and uh, of course um, it uh, has happened uh, um, we need to just uh, take it into consideration all these processes thank you i think we had a fruitful discussion but uh, we you, the audience can still give us questions uh, maybe uh, one or two <laughs> Very short question that I cannot understand. Belarus and Independence Day, when should it be celebrated? I know that uh, you had several dates and the 3rd of July was picked. I would like to know, is it uh, relevant? To the 25th of March, All of us are representing this spectrum. So for us, of course, it's the 25th of March. And we understand that the 3rd of July is not related to the statehood and uh, independence at all. Vadim, you had a question. Vadim Marzejka, Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies, BISS, analyst. So the 25th of March is the Day of Republic, but is it the Day of the Independence? My question is uh, for Andrei. I think that you have uh, um, told us why the nomenclature of BSSR couldn't do the same as the nomenclature in other European republics, but this a paradox that the new nomenclature that um, won uh, didn't do anything, just copied. It, it won, but uh, it, uh, it was victorious, but it didn't offer anything new. So this is a projection to the uh, so, so what do you think the new nomenclature, how um, it, it, it hasn't copied uh, the Soviet one by 100%. So what in principle have changed in the new nomenclature? Uh, we need a lecture here. And uh, I don't know for few uh, few few hours most probably. First of all, there was a personal regime. Uh, some party came into power. Таких категорий. Проблема заключалась в том, что пришел один человек. Пришел человек, который. One person came into power. He had no political ideas. There are dictators or authoritarian leaders who have some political um, ideas, uh, but the, the, but he just uh, took all the institutes that were before him. For example. Before him, there was no party of authority. It is an interesting phenomenon how uh, no party of authority was uh, established. They were everywhere. And Lukashenko didn't... Uh, uh, Lukashenko didn't uh, create it too, and we still don't have it. So, in fact, the idea wasn't there. 
But in a situational manner, the institutes were changing. There was no plan. For example, the time came, uh, the time came for the economic reform, and this economic reform uh, uh, was uh, initiated. But what has uh, changed? A lot has changed. I cannot actually, uh, uh, I cannot actually uh, answer this question in uh, three minutes. But this was all uh, changing. Uh, uh, in a situational manner, uh, because uh, the, we, these were operative problems, and uh, they were uh, solved as uh, they uh, emerged, uh, and this was just uh, amateur, uh, amateur um, and personalized uh, authority and it is uh, concentrated in the hands of one person. The problem of uh, Lukashenko, or the phenomenon of Lukashenko, is that uh, he has always uh, he has always been afraid uh, to create some institutes, and he always wants the power all in his hands. And he uh, didn't have the nomenclature um, experience or political play experience, so he has simplified all the politics, and um, he is, has simplified. He did not create institutes so that they do not uh, uh, make the political game complex. So there were no strong fractions in the parliament, no strong parties, uh, because uh, this would all make their political arena complex. And uh, it is very, if it's in short what I can say, because it's quite a wide um, issue. And Belarusian state ideology or even using the some any version of nationalism yeah it, it was also non-relevant uh, because the ideology is very abs abstract in belarus uh, if it's a bssr it is um, it has no content behind it if it's a statehood it also has uh, it's it's empty it has no content uh, and um, i think uh, this is the same logic to, to simplify everything uh, Oh, and uh, just uh, because we do, we, we want uh, to pass this uh, symbolic capital or assets to somebody. He didn't want to do it, and he understood that this uh, will make him uh, um, not that strong, and that's why he was simplifying all the political game, all the political arena. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're in time, and uh, now I think we uh, have some time for the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists.